Today's scripture reading is the book of Mark, chapter 2, and verse 1 through 12. And when he returned to the Kavanaugh after some days, it was reported that he was at home, and many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And uh, he was preaching the word to them, and they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And uh, when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they lay down under the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive the sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk. But uh, but that you may know that the Son of Man had authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic. I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose, and immediately picked up his bed, and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Amen. You know, I remember the first time I went on a missions trip. I went to Thailand, and I remember having some cultural training before we started. And the, the really funny thing is, the biggest thing we were taught to do was to make sure that we respect the king over there. And in Thailand, the king is a very important figure. You see his face just on billboards all over the place. And we were told that we need to respect the king and even just respect images of the king. And one of those things is you'll find the picture of the king on money and we have to be very careful what we did with our money. Couldn't let the money fall on the ground because he had so much authority that if you were found to be disrespectful to the king in that way, you could even be put in jail. This was amazing to me. I was like, uh, coming from Australia, I had no point of reference for this kind of authority, right? And I remember just being absolutely amazed that, you know what, that kind of authority is nothing compared to the authority that our Lord and our Savior, Jesus, has over sin and over sickness. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. Like we sung, we thank you for the name of Jesus that is above all things, Lord God. We thank you that you have authority over sin. You have authority over sickness. Uh, you are Lord of all. As we go into your word, we pray that you would speak to us. You would stir our faith again, Lord, to believe in the fullness of who Jesus is. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're starting a new series today. I have the privilege of being the, the first cab off the rank, so to speak. <laughs> and the, the series is God of Miracles. And we're going to be going through the book of Mark, looking at Jesus and the miracles he did and the lordship that he has over everything. So today we're going to start by looking at his lordship over sin and over sickness. And as we go through this, this portion or, or this story, we're going to look at five points that show us why we should have faith in Jesus, why we can believe that this is who he is. He is lord over sickness. So let's start with number one. Number one. I just want to read out verse 2 and 3 to you again. Um, I'm reading from the New King James, so it might sound a little different. But it says, Immediately many gathered together 
So there was no longer room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. And then they came to him bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. So there's two things to be noted, noted here. The first is that Jesus was captivating, right? He was captivating. People immediately gathered from all over the place to come and hear what he taught. Can you imagine that? They couldn't even find room in the doorways. It was just packed with people. So the question we have to ask ourselves today is, are we still captivated by Jesus? Will we still run to every encounter that we might be able to have with Jesus? Let's run to him. And you know, we see an amazing example of this in the Bible with David, King David. You know, the Bible talks about him being a man after God's own heart. And I just want to read this scripture, one of my favorites, Psalm 27. We just talked about the Psalms. Psalm 27, verse 4. It says, One thing I have desired of the Lord, one thing I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Why? To behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. Yeah, that word for beauty means pleasant delight in the Hebrew. Just to delight in God. That's the one thing David wanted. And you know, we need to take every opportunity we have. We just we're talking about, hey, let's come here, let's come together. Run to Jesus. Run to have an encounter with him. Secondly, these men didn't just come for themselves, right? They dragged another person along who needed Jesus. They came bringing this paralyzed man on a bed. They didn't just come for themselves. They brought someone who really needed Jesus to Jesus. So like a paralyzed, excuse me, like a paralyzed person on a mat, who are you dragging to Jesus? Who can we bring to him? It made me think about my own life. Technically speaking, excuse me, technically speaking, my mum was the one that brought me to Jesus. When I was a young kid, I had medical issues and she just went to every person to have me prayed for, to have, it, it caused us as a family to run to Jesus. What a blessing. And I'm so thankful that my mom like just ran to Jesus and took me to Jesus. But on the other hand, I remember the time when I took my best friend to youth group. I was maybe 17 years old, 18, 17, 18, and I, I took him to youth group. I didn't do anything else. I didn't know what else to do. I was 17 years old. I just took him because I knew Jesus was at youth group. And I knew that if he came there, to be honest, I didn't think too much about it. I was just a teenager. But I brought him there. And you know what? He met Jesus there. God changed his life. He repented. He turned to Christ. He's a pastor today in Australia. And even, I mean, we can get impressed by that. Oh, he's a pastor now today. But more than that, for me personally, we walked our faith journeys together as best friends. That's blessed me. Now, it's a blessing for me to be brought to Jesus, but what a blessing it is that I can walk with Jesus because I brought my friend to Jesus. Amen. Let's find the guy on the mat. <laughs> yeah. You know, one. We, d we don't have to have all the answers. You know, I was 17, I didn't have all the answers. So let's be honest, I didn't have any answers. You know, I just knew I had one. Bring him along. We don't have to have it all sorted out. We just need to bring them, yeah? So number one, it's about somebody else. Number two, they were committed to this friend. Because you know what? Sometimes this process isn't easy. Let me read verse four. It says, And when they could not come near because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken through, they let down the bed. 
on which the paralytic was lying. Sometimes there's a crowd hindering. (laughs) Maybe not a crowd, but sometimes there's an obstacle in the way. And it takes commitment, it takes persistence to bring that person to Jesus. These obstacles can be many things. It can be doubt in that person. It can be pressure from others, pressure from family. It can be fear, misunderstanding, just a lack of urgency. All of these things. Um, we need to be committed, friends. When, when there's crowds, when there's a roof in the way, that we're committed to break through these things in order to bring them to Jesus. We don't need to pressure them. We don't need to make decisions for them. We just need to pray and persist in prayer. We need to love them and do practically what we can. We need to have a gospel conversation, (laughs) right? (laughs) We need to do those things that God is putting on our heart to do. You know, I had another friend. I'm talking to a lot of friends and testimonies. I had another friend growing up. I grew up in kids' church, and the two of us grew up in kids' church. We went to the same high school together. And in our teenage years, we had some experimental seasons, wayward times, but we didn't, well, I didn't stray too far. And um, when I was 17, I came back to Christ in a, in a powerful way, but he kind of turned the other way, left church, got caught up, in just like playing music, partying, and all that kind of stuff. And and I was like, I was committed. I'm going to drag him back to Jesus. And uh, I remember him as a little kid. And this is why I knew God was, he had met God at some stage. Is when we were little kids, I remember him worshiping. And I remember as like a 10-year-old kid looking at him and just being challenged. And just being like, whoa, like, what he has is real, you know. So I knew that was still in there somewhere. And, uh, and so I just kept loving this guy. I kept going to his house, kept playing music with him. I didn't have all the, uh, uh, I didn't have all the, the answers again. Um, but one day, after much prayer, after much persistence, I wasn't even involved. But he woke up and said to his parents, I want to go to church. <laughs> and he, he came to he came to church, repented, got his life all right with God. Now, again, he's serving God. He's on staff in a church back home. Like, he's a great guy. But sometimes we need to commit. And the biggest commitment there is on our knees in prayer, right? We need to keep on praying. It's a process. It's a process. And there's one thing that I, particularly in this Version, a version of the scripture. It says, when they had broken through. And you know, there's a point of breakthrough. And I really want to take some time to say this today. Maybe there's someone in your life where you've been committed for a long time, pushing through, pushing through, pushing through, praying, 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 believing, believing, believing. I want to encourage you today and say, there is a point of breakthrough. God is faithful. There's a point of breakthrough. Keep going. Keep going. Keep be, being committed. Keep praying for them. Keep loving them. Amen. So be committed to your friend. Now, the third thing was Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, it says in, in, in verse 5, he said to the paralytic, your sons are, f- your sons, your sins are forgiven. It's interesting that this passage doesn't say their tenacity was what got God's attention. It was their compassion or their love. No, 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 it wasn't that. Those are admirable things. Those are good things. But Jesus, he saw their faith. And he saw that they believed in him. They believed that he was God. They believed he had authority over sin and he had authority over sickness. They believed in that. And that's what caused Jesus to respond. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And then 
if you look at chapter 11, it goes through all these heroes of faith that it was their faith that caused them to be in this hall of fame, right? Abraham and Moses are great examples of this. You know, it's really not... We, we sometimes think of uh, the, the disciplines, how much I pray, how much I, I, I read the word and how much I do this. And these are all good things, but God's not impressed by the discipline. He's impressed by the faith that is produced by the discipline. This is what pleases him. Recently, I went and saw Pastor Ben's band play, Alluvia. And I was sitting there and I was, Joy, I hope this doesn't embarrass, actually, I don't really mind if it embarrasses him, to be honest. But um, as I was listening to the music, I was just so blown away by how awesome this music was. But I didn't sit there and think, man, I'm just so impressed by how much practice would have gone into this. No, I was enjoying the actual music itself, right? The actual experience and everything. It's, I mean, it's admirable. It's amazing how much like practice goes into that. And it's needed too. Let's not overlook that. But what actually blessed me was the music itself. And that's with, with God is what actually is your faith. Because that's the product, right? Amen, amen. So Jesus responded to their faith. You know, and he challenged. So what it was, was the faith that they believed in who Jesus was. And Jesus, he challenged his own disciples about this. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13 to 17, we see him challenging his own disciples. He says, when, it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples saying, who do men say that I am? And they say, some say the John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? Who do you believe me to be? And Peter, this is where Peter gets it right, right? He jumps up and says, you are Christ, son of the living God. And uh, Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father. So who is Jesus to you today? Is he Lord? Is he Master? Is he King? Is he Friend? Is he Healer? Is he Saviour? Is he Deliverer? Is he a miracle worker? Which do you believe? Or is he all of these things, right? Like the Bible says, do, do we believe in the fullness of who he is? It's time to believe that he is Lord and he is Lord of all. He's Lord of sin. He's Lord of sickness. He's Lord of it all. So Jesus saw their faith. Number four is Jesus saw his need. And this is very interesting. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And at first glance, we can think, man, what is Jesus doing here? It's obvious. This guy wants healing, right? And you're forgiving his sins. <laughs> It's an obvious request. What's Jesus doing here? Well, Jesus has a way of seeing past the physical to what is really paralyzing us. His ways are higher than ours. He sees things on a whole other level. And we need to learn and trust in him. Trust him to heal us the way he wants to heal us. You know, it's a famous scripture we all know in Isaiah 55, 8 to 9, says that God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. As the heavens are as higher than the earth, so your ways, so his ways are higher than our ways. We need to trust in that. You know, that our intellect, our vision is partial at best. He sees it all. And he knows how to heal us. Sometimes it looks like he doesn't hear us, right? But he's preparing us for the answer. He's doing it his way. Remember, Jesus heals his body. He does heal his body, but he sees this. This is an issue. Just as an example, like I could have pain in my joints. And I could be praying, God, heal my joints. And, and God knows that. The cause of these joints is actually a drinking problem. And that drinking problem is linked to a heart condition. 
that is about a, is, comes from a broken relationship. So would a good father come and just heal the pain from that and let you continue to, to hurt on the inside? No, we don't have the vision to see sometimes what is the problem, but he does. He's God. He knows it all. And we need to put our trust in him. You know, and these things are not always connected and linked together like this, all right? This is an example. But no matter how it all fits together, we need to trust in God that he knows what he's doing. The man in our text needed forgiveness and he needed physical healing. And Jesus dealt with both of these in the right way at the right time. Jesus knows how to set us free. Regardless of how long it takes or how God chooses to do it, we need to believe in him. This is who he is. This is the authority that he has. It's time for God's people to have this kind of tenacious faith again. So, fifth and, and final point. Which is easier to believe? Which is easier to believe? Let's read verses 8 to 12 again. It says, But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to you? Your sins are forgiven or arise and take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take your bed and go to your house. Immediately he rose and took up his bed and he went out in the presence of them all. And they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. The scribes were offended at the idea that Jesus could forgive sins. You see, in their tradition, they could more easily accept that Jesus maybe healed someone. I mean, that was still a huge stretch, but it was, it was not as much of a stretch because the fact that Jesus was saying he forgives sins is he's just saying, I, I'm God. And this is what really, really offended them. They were outraged. Uh, so Jesus questioned them, which is, e which is easier? As, as me, as the Son of God, which is easier for me to say? Your sins are forgiven or arise in a walk because I'm Lord over both of these things. Which one is easier? They're not, not one is easier than the other. And similar, excuse me, it's similarly in our backgrounds, we and our experiences can cause us to believe that Jesus is maybe one or the other. You know, maybe I've had a struggle with health in my life and I struggle to believe that Jesus is Lord over sickness. Or maybe I've just struggled with cyclical sin in my life and I can't just imagine that Jesus set me free from my sin. I can live free of that. Or maybe I've been just believing that God would save someone in my family. But I just, I just can't believe that, that God is, is Lord over that. Well, let me tell you, he's Lord over all. He's Lord over all. Which is easier for you to believe? Jesus heals the heart. He heals the body. If you need your heart to be healed, if you need salvation, he heals. He sets free. If your body needs healing, he heals and sets free. We don't decide how this happens, but we walk with him in it. We believe in him. He is Lord over all. And I just want to finish by saying something a little bit personal. You might be looking at me and thinking, you're telling me, Jesus, you know, he's Lord over this, Lord over that. And it's obvious that, that I have medical issues that I still deal with today. And you might think it's hypocritical for me to stand up here and say, Jesus is Lord over sickness. But you know what? We cannot let our experience change the fact of who Jesus is. And I will not let my experience 
change who he is. The word determines who he is and says that he is Lord of all. He's Lord over sickness. He's Lord over sin and over death. Mate, you know, and like I said, we need to realize that it's the word that determines who he is. He is who he said he is. And you know what? Moses waited 40 years to see his promise, his deliverance. Abraham, 25 to step into the promise. We need to be prepared to stand in faith again. As long as it takes to step into what God is bringing us to. You know, we need to be prepared as people of God that I am going to be tenacious in my faith and I'm going to stand as long as it takes to to see God move and I'm not going to tell him how to do it. I'm going to stand back and say, God, this is who you are. This is who you are and I choose to believe it. No matter what's in my life, no matter what's around me, I believe who you are. You are still a miracle worker. who he is he is and jesus is a miracle worker we need to believe in him again for that yes i just want to we don't normally do this but i just want to take a moment to to pray you know as we kind of slow down i just want to take a moment because i believe there's people in this room where you are either struggling with one of these areas. Maybe there's sickness in your body. Maybe there's, there's sin in your life and you just can't get rid of it. Maybe there is it's a family member, someone you've been trying to pull, drag to Jesus, but that roof, I just can't break through it, right? Well... I'm going to pray for you right now. So let's just, you know, the Holy Spirit is here. And I just want you all to bow your heads, close your eyes. And as I pray, you know, if that's you, I just want you to say in your heart, God, this is me. I give it to you. And, And what I'm praying is that we would all believe in Jesus again. If your faith has grown weary that you would pick that up again and put your faith in Jesus. That this is who he is. So let's pray. God, I want to thank you right now. God, I thank you for every person in this room, Lord, even those serving. God, that for each one of us, Lord, that we would know that you are Lord over sin and Lord over sickness. There's nothing too big for you, and you are a miracle worker. And God, for those that have maybe grown tired, Lord God, I pray that you would stir their faith again to believe in you. And even right now, God, I pray that you would touch people's lives who need healing. Healing in their heart, healing in their body, Lord. God, you are a miracle worker, so let's believe in you right now, Lord God, to do miracles in our our midst, Lord. We call on your name, Jesus. So God, I pray for each and every person here, Lord, whatever their issue is, that you would heal them, God, that you would bring them to a place of salvation and deliverance in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. I just, as the band is coming up, I also just want to say that if God, the Holy Spirit's touching you and God's moving, we have a prayer team. I just want to recommend you to go to the prayer team and have someone pray for you, continue to minister to you um, if you want to. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to reinforce that as well. Thank you so much.